Well, welcome to the uh, second series of the Maritime Security Roundtable discussion, uh, being led by the Center for Asia Pacific Strategy, or CAPS, uh, based in Washington, DC. Uh, the Center for Asia Pacific Strategy is a, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization committed to supporting research and seminars for innovative approaches to Asia Pacific security. Uh, CAPS leverages its extensive military and diplomatic expertise to develop actionable policy recommendations, uh, which in turn are customized for governments in the region. In effect, CAPS is trying to enhance Asia-Pacific regional security by strengthening the synergy and effectiveness of the strategic coalition of democratic nations through the development of intellectually sound and operationally feasible solutions. So today's topic is maritime security in the Asia Pacific region, uh, with a particular focus on China and the littoral states. I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists that we have uh, with us today. Uh, the first of which is the Honorable Philip uh, Dalidakis. Uh, Philip is a former trade minister for the state of Victoria, Australia. Uh, he is now managing partner of Horizontas, which is a CEO advisory firm that specializes in climate change, corporate affairs and cross-border commerce. Uh, in addition, Philip is the non-executive director at uh, Growth Ops and Impact for Women. Our second panelist is Dr. Jay uh, Batong Bakal. Uh, Jay is a director of the Institute for Maritime Affairs and Law of the Sea at the University of the Philippines Law Center. And finally, our moderator today is Commander John Odom. Uh, John is a military professor uh, of international law in the College of International and Security Studies at the George C. Marshall European Center. So that's all from me. Uh, let's now engage the topic and I'll hand you across to John, uh, Philip, and Jay. Thank you. The focus of our roundtable discussion today is to examine China's actions in the South and East China Seas and to consider what other states can and should do in these two situations. There are many strategic and security challenges in both of these situations. One of the practical challenges facing us today is that one hour will never be enough time to discuss every aspect of these situations or every action by China in them. But we cannot let the impossibility of addressing all aspects of these situations prevent us from discussing any of them. Therefore, a realistic goal for us should be to highlight illustrative examples that reflect some of the major challenges in these two situations and ask our panelists to analyze these challenges and invite them to recommend ways for addressing them effectively. In theory, a realist would say that every state in the international system behaves in furtherance of its own national interests. In practice, however, not every state involved in these two situations behaves in the same way or to the same degree in order to further its interests. In fact, the People's Republic of China employs all instruments of its national power in a strategic and comprehensive manner in these situations with minimal to no accommodation to any other state involved. Therefore, to set the scene for our roundtable discussion, I'd like to highlight three themes of China's behavior in these two unresolved situations of the South and East China Seas. First, the PRC is the only claimant state, not just in East Asia, but anywhere in the world, who asserts an absurd claim based on an ambiguous dashed line that is completely unjustifiable under international law. China's dashed line in the South China Sea is fairly well known for audiences who track security developments in East Asia, but what it cannot be overstated is just how big of an obstacle China's insistence of that line as a legitimate claim is to any potential for real progress in managing and resolving the South China Sea situation. In 1947, at the end of World War II, a survey team from the Republic of China drew the predecessor of this line on a map when they returned to Taipei to brief their government's leaders. Historical research in Taipei of the internal government archives from that time period has confirmed that the predecessor line was intended only to summarize a sovereignty claim to the islands located within the line 
and not a claim to any special status of the waters lying therein. But in what could be best described as either historic revisionism or political alchemy, Beijing has attempted to transform this dashed line with limited meaning into some sort of super claim in order to justify whatever China wants in the South China Sea and in total disregard of what international law allows coastal states to claim. And in response, eight years ago, the Philippines brought a case against China before an arbitral tribunal under UNCLOS, asserting in part that China's dashed line violated international law. That international tribunal agreed with the Philippines and invalidated China's dashed line as an unlawful maritime claim. This judicial decision was and continues to be binding on China as a matter of international law, yet China refuses to respect and abide by that ruling and has taken active and persistent measures to delegitimize that ruling. More troubling than China refusing to abandon the dashed line is that China continues to behave in waters within this dashed line in ways that aggravate the friction of the South China Sea situation. China is increasing its maritime survey activities and the lawful EEZs of other claimant states like Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Indonesia. China repeatedly looks the other way when Chinese flesh flag fishing boats operate in waters where the dash line offer overlaps with lawful EEZs of other claimant states. And China's Coast Guard forces often accompany these fishing boats to deter other coastal states from lawfully engaging in law enforcement to protect their lawful sovereign rights within their lawful EEZs. If we look ahead to the future for the likelihood of finding a solution for these disputes, we see how China's insistence on the dash line reflects the largest barrier to any resolution. One could reasonably argue that each of the other South China Sea claimants would likely be willing to adopt a 200 nautical mile belt of EEZ measured from its mainland coast and use the median line for EEZ boundaries in areas where a full 200 miles is not possible. But China is the sole outlier who continues to insist that areas should be shared where its unjustified dash line overlap with these justifiable EEZs. Contemporary negotiating theory says that parties to a dispute cannot achieve a bargain solution when there is no zone of possible agreement, or ZOPA. That is an overlap among the set of options that each of the parties would deem acceptable. China's dash line claim is solely responsible for eliminating the existence of a ZOPA in the South China Sea situation. Second, the PRC has dedicated tremendous resources over the past few years to fortify its position and solidify its power in these situations to an unprecedented level. In the South China Sea, China has engaged in massive land reclamation and what I sometimes describe as claymation because it's areas where islands did not previously exist. Beijing's intended purpose for these activities is unclear, and the International Tribunal nullified those actions of having any effect on increasing China's lawful maritime claims. But regardless, these Chinese-occupied features now exist. Beijing has emplaced highly capable military installations and systems on several of these features. Beijing knows no other nation will attempt to knock China off of them, and China has successfully changed the status quo to its advantage. In both bodies of water, China has also militarized its coast guard. There was a time in the past when Chinese officials would emphasize to other governments that China was not militarizing these situations, pointing to Beijing's deliberate use of white holes and not gray holes as a good faith measure. But that narrative has become less and less convincing over time through Beijing's change in command and control, domestic authority, and operational capabilities of its coast guard. In 2018, China shifted its Coast Guard from the civilian control of the State Oceanic Administration to the People's Armed Police under the military command of the Central Military Commission. In January of this year, China enacted a new Coast Guard law, which contains many provisions about which other countries have expressed significant concerns. And over the past decade, China has dramatically increased the number of ships in its Coast Guard fleet from 60 to 130 and built significantly larger ships with advanced weapon systems that dwarf the gray hull navies of many other countries in East Asia, including a number of the states that have unresolved territorial and maritime disputes with China. And in both bodies of water, China has also deployed its maritime militia. A decade ago, another narrative pushed by Beijing was that some of the questionable behavior by Chinese flag fishing boats and their crews 
was merely the unprompted action of what they described as patriotic fishermen. But thanks to the research by external scholars into domestic websites in the PRC over the past decade, we know that was also a false narrative being pushed by Beijing. Many of the fishing boats and their crews are in fact mobilized as China's maritime militia who are directed by the Chinese military and the Chinese Communist Party who receive funding and training from them and who are called upon to act in furtherance of China's strategic objectives. These maritime militia forces overwhelm the maritime law enforcement capacity of other claimant states in both the South and East China Seas, such as the famous incident in August 2016, when 230 Chinese fishing boats showed up around the Senkaku Islands and challenged Japan's Coast Guard. Additionally, these maritime militia forces also post, pose a risky wild card for causing potential collisions and loss of life with other navies transiting and operating lawfully in these bodies of water. And third and finally, the PRC has sought to eliminate any method of resolving these disputes other than via bilateral negotiations in which Beijing can leverage maximum pressure. China has ruled out the use of international courts to address any of these disputes, implying that these third-party dispute mechanisms are in some way inappropriate for resolving these disputes. At the same time, China continues to nominate its judges as recent as last year to serve as members of the ICJ and it laws, the two judicial bodies with extensive experience and jurisprudence in addressing and resolving territorial and maritime disputes. So curiously, these forums for resolving international disputes peacefully are acceptable for China to judge other nations, but not for other nations to judge China. China has also invoked its special status as a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Most recently in August of this year, when India served as the rotating president of the Security Council and convened a meeting on maritime security, Beijing's representative at the meeting said, quote, the Security Council is the, not the right place to discuss the issue of the South China Sea, end quote. China has also neutralized the potential for other South China Sea claimant states from developing any collective strength in the regional forum of ASEAN. Since its inception, this 10-member organization has followed the ASEAN way of organizational decision-making by a consensus among all of its member states. Beijing has exploited the system in several ways. First and foremost, it has co-opted its friends like Cambodia and Laos, thereby negating the potential for ASEAN consensus on any substantive matter involving the South China Sea. Additionally, when Manila initiated its arbitration case, Beijing engaged in a whispering campaign among the other ASEAN members that the Philippines was the rogue member who was responsible for destabilizing relations within the region. China has also punished several East Asian states economically over the past decade, thereby messaging to them and other states that they should think twice before being too assertive in their territorial and maritime disputes with China. And at the same time, China has sought to sweeten the economic pot and gain economic leverage over claimant states through its Belt and Road Initiative. For example, in 2019, China bid for taking over operations of the shipyard in Subic Bay, Philippines. Then more recently in January of this year, China announced a $940 million deal between Beijing and Manila to build a railway between Subic Bay and Clark Air Base. China insists on bilateral negotiations to resolve these disputes, but for many of these disputes, that is a legal impossibility under longstanding international law because more than two claimants claim some of these disputed islands and two parties cannot legally bind a third party who was not at the negotiation. The net result of these comprehensive efforts by China is either that the disputes will never be resolved and China will benefit from the ongoing power-based status quo, or that these disputes will be resolved, but in a manner in which it is questionable whether the other parties involuntarily conceded to whatever China wanted. Neither of those outcomes is in the best interest of other claimant states or to the international rules-based order. Now, that concludes my opening marks to set the scene and we'll now shift our discussion uh, to a number of questions that I would welcome thoughts and insights from the two experts joining us today. Gentlemen, thank you to both of you for participating in this roundtable. Now, the first question, uh, I'll pose this one to Jay, and this involves the, uh, the arbitration case. The life of the South China Sea arbitration case 
as you know, Jay, straddled the political history of the Philippines, with the case being initiated by the Aquino administration and the tribunal issuing its decision during the early days of the Duterte administration. Uh, President Duterte, his uh, support for the favorable legal ruling has, some would argue, wavered. But his six-year term limit, uh, which in the Philippine system is only allowed to have one term, will end, as you know, in 2022. Will the South China Sea situation generally, and the arbitration decision in particular, be an issue, you think, in this coming year's presidential election? And will the arbitration rulings decision fade away in the politics of the next administration in Manila, or do you think its importance will endure? Well, thank you, John, for that question. I think that the arbitration decision and the South China Sea situation will be an issue in the elections because definitely uh, certain developments just this year, changes in the government's posture, for example, and the way that they are addressing China and its activities uh, in the South China Sea, there is a very marked uh, change no? uh, between what happened this year, what they've done this year, and the past five years. That to me indicates that the government, the administration, is aware that it can become an election issue and that it is a weakness that they need to uh, address by presenting a more robust uh, posture this year. A second, there's also a, a lot more awareness on the part of the public. The, um, the um, question of China, its role in the economy, what it is doing in the South China Sea, uh, the uh, effect of the policies of the administration on the uh, Philippines' claims in the South China Sea. These have all uh, become um, items of regular conversations, uh, even among uh, business groups, religious groups, and ordinary people. So I think that it definitely will be a factor, uh, an item, to be discussed as people uh, talk about their uh, choices for president. The key question, however, is how influential this issue will be on their final decision, because as you know, it also competes with a lot of other uh, issues. No? Uh, and so this is probably something that uh, will be uh, a matter for more discussion, especially as we get closer to the elections. Great, thank you. And I would also invite uh, Philip's comment as a, uh, coming from a, a non-claimant state. Uh, over the past two years, there have been a number of statements that uh, countries have issued diplomatic demarches, including the United States, including Australia, including uh, France, Germany, and the UK, uh, including most recently Japan and New Zealand. Uh, and these statements uh, favorably endorsing that ruling and continuing to remind the international community that it's a legitimate ruling. Uh, Trend-wise, do you think this will continue among non-claimant states, or do you think it will gradually fade into memory as well? Yeah, Jonathan, I think it's a really good question. I think that the fact that you've seen a number of non-claimant states uh, becoming more overt uh, and forward-facing with their, uh, their views, uh, constructive criticisms in relation to the events of recent years, I think demonstrates that that will only be stronger in years to come. You only have to look at the uh, Australian government's recent uh, positioning or posturing to see that we have become far more uh, forward facing with our opposition to decisions taken in Beijing. As an example of the fact that we take these issues, these policies very seriously. And that's not without uh, direct economic consequences. Uh, you know, it's been covered uh, well and truly right across uh, the uh, Western media that as a direct result of the position that the Australian government has taken, that there have been uh, trade consequences for different industries and also for specific companies that have been exporting goods into China. And so as a result, it becomes this delicate and finely balanced uh, policy position. What do you do in terms of a global order when the order that you're looking to assert is not actually acknowledged by the very country that you're looking to assert it with? It's great, a very legitimate question. Uh, and it is, it, it's one of the grand strategic challenges posing the uh, international community in a number of our countries at the present time. Thank you for asking. Um, so in keeping with that and talking about the, 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 the litigation option, 
um, because we know in the situation with the Philippines, uh, there was the standoff in Scarborough Shoal in 2012, uh, in which uh, both the Philippines and China agreed to pull back from uh, Scarborough Shoal area. The Philippines kept the deal, they backed off, uh, but China did not. And that many argue was one of the catalysts for why China, uh, Philippines decided to uh, file their case before the arbitral tribunal. Once the Philippines filed that case, they received a lot of pressure uh, in various ways, diplomatic, economic, and others from uh, Beijing. And, uh, but as a result, the Philippines stuck with it. They earned themselves a favorable ruling that's binding as a matter of international law. And what they also showed was it's a potential viable option for other smaller claimant states to consider in trying to protect their sovereignty and their sovereign rights. Um, one of the things public reports indicates that at least one of the other claimant states, Vietnam, has engaged with high powered international law firm about the possibility of initiating a similar arbitration case to protect its rights under UNCLOS uh, versus how China has infringed it. Jay, how likely do you think it is that another country other than the Philippines would initiate this type of a case against China, uh, similar to the one uh, to the Philippines? Should they do it? Why or why not? Well, I think among the claimants, of course, the, the one that is furthest along, as you mentioned, along this line of uh, possibly initiating litigation is Vietnam. But Vietnam is, I think, still hesitating because uh, it is um, it has not yet reached the point where it feels that it has no other option. I think it is still uh, trying to find uh, other means of addressing their problems with China. But uh, given how China has been acting against Vietnam, particularly by deploying its uh, deploying unilateral uh, petroleum exploration in its continental shelf, I think the uh, field uh, is really narrowing for Vietnam, and they may be pushed at some point to initiate uh, even just a laser-like, very focused litigation to, to, to try to deter uh, further uh, Chinese uh, coercion along this line. Uh, Malaysia, I think, uh, is not yet um, ready to consider this as an option, uh, given that the compared to, say, Vietnam and the Philippines, uh, its uh, history of dealing with these disputes has been always to try to resolve it quietly and behind closed doors. Um, Brunei, I think, will not be considering this option at this point because, uh, let's face it, uh, Brunei really is a relatively uh, small country and its economy, we may not be able to uh, withstand uh, a, a um, coercive um, policy uh, by China. It is trying, in fact, to uh, secure alternatives to its um, economic uh, development by engaging with China. Now, the interesting uh, um, party here would be Indonesia, which is officially not a claimant. And yet, as we've seen in the past few months, uh, China has... Uh, deployed the same tactics uh, that it has deployed uh, against Vietnam. No? It conducted unilateral petroleum uh, exploration in, in Indonesia's uh, EEZ areas. This might actually be an opening for Indonesia to consider litigation, uh, despite the fact, or maybe because it is not a claimant. And that makes uh, China's action even uh, more likely to be uh, subject to uh, a legal uh, um, um, action. Okay. Yeah. No, I, so, I, Jay, I agree. With Jay, you. that's can I can I just jump in, Jonathan? Because Jay, Jay makes some really interesting points about what some nation states may or may not choose to do. And and as somebody that has worked at a sub jurisdictional level and left the foreign policy to our national government, it's always important to recognise that the the ability to go to an international court. Uh, and seek some type of decision or jurisdiction over, over the disagreement is actually one that should be used more often, not less often, by nation states. And it's, it's, a, it's a really strong tool to be able to draw whichever country you're using it against into uh, a different forum, for want of a better term, to try and move away from confrontation. And I think that we will see uh, more uh, ASEAN countries, uh, Jonathan, look to using that, if nothing else, to putting a sort of a, 
a place marker in the sand, for want of a better term, because you can always withdraw your claim, you can always withdraw your action. But if that's the impetus to be able to try and seek further negotiations, then certainly that's something that I think you'll find that political leaders will uh, attempt to use uh, in their, shall I call it, their bag of tricks. I'm not sure, Jay, if you have a view on that either. No, I, th- I agree completely. Uh, it really should be resorted more often because that means that we are essentially reinforcing the international legal system and really taking advantage of peaceful modes of dispute settlement instead uh, of allowing uh, power to decide it, uh, whether it's through an overt use of force or through uh, subtle uh, coercion. So I think uh, I, I agree with, I, I agree with uh, what you said about that. Uh, I would also like to add no, that actually the Philippines, uh, within the Philippine government, there are actually uh, some offices that are actively considering further litigation uh, as a follow-up to the uh, case. And there have been some uh, initiatives uh, to try to, uh, in a way, prepare for the possibility of additional litigation should that become necessary. Interesting. Well, thanks for sharing that, Jay. Yeah, one of the things when I discuss in class and talk about the South China Sea situation, I give as an example, uh, one of the, uh, when litigation becomes a viable option oftentimes is when the recognition that the the stalemate will not change. And I often ask the question, is there anything that Manila could say to Beijing that would convince Beijing that they're correct? Likewise, is there anything that Beijing could say to Manila or Beijing could say to Kuala Lumpur or to Jakarta that would convince them that they're correct or vice versa? If the answer is no, then you'll never have a resolution of these disputes unless you submit it to a third party mechanism. Uh, So thank you for for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, And I also appreciate you bringing up Indonesia and considering uh, Indonesia as a as a potential uh, player uh, deciding to invoke their rights through uh, litigation as well. Uh, As you said, Indonesia tends to want want to to view itself as a claimant. Uh, but in some ways, China is pulling them into the situation as a claimant against their will, in the sense that the nine dash line overlaps with the EEZ of the Natuna Islands. Uh, I remember a few years ago, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesman in Beijing was asked about uh, the situation or the disputes with Indonesia. And they said, as to the Natuna Islands, we don't think that there's a sovereignty dispute. As to the maritime disputes, we're not going to discuss that at this time. And I thought, whoa, they're saying they do have disputes with Indonesia. So I think the jury is out uh, literally on whether Indonesia will move forward with that. But I think uh, it's important to highlight Indonesia as one of those players, being that Indonesia is one of the more powerful members of the ASEAN uh, Association. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, Moving to the next uh, question is talking about, I would like to talk about the role of external powers in in the region. External maritime powers have a presence in the waters of East Asia, uh, including in the South China Sea. Some of these external states, such as the United States and Australia, have persistently operated in and over these waters for a number of years in a lawful manner. Uh, Other external states, such as France, India, uh, the United Kingdom, and most recently Germany in the past few weeks, have operated in this area. Um, How do claimant states, Jay, uh, including Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam, view the growing presence of these external maritime powers? Well, again, uh, very uh, in very different ways, no? as you've seen, as we've seen from the reactions to the AUKUS, for example, the Philippines openly welcomed the formation of the AUKUS, um, and this is really probably based on the fact that it has the longest experience with uh, military alliances and security uh, arrangements with the parties involved. Uh, Vietnam has been a little bit more cautious and uh, has been dealing with it. Uh, at arm's length, and this is understandable given that uh, it had a history uh, with uh, the United States of uh, warfare in the 70s. So this could be part of the uh, um, reconciliation process, so to speak. Uh, And um, with respect to Malaysia, Malaysia has been more wary and uh, probably bordering on suspicion for some people because it has uh, traditionally um, um, viewed uh, the um, participation of external powers as a potential uh, danger, uh, probably more than the Philippines or Vietnam ever had. No? So we see these di- diverse uh, um, views uh, really uh, preventing ASEAN from coming out with a really solid and united stand 
uh, with respect to the external powers. And this is really just reflective of an even longer history within ASEAN of, of having this sort of ambivalent uh, attitude towards the, what essentially were former colonizers and now uh, partners. And so they really uh, have uh, not yet been able to come up with a, a really solid uh, um, posture and perspective with respect to this uh, issue. Great. And, and Philip, for you, uh, from the perspective of uh, those external powers, what do you think are the right ways to do this uh, for these external powers to, to have that presence, uh, not to, uh, to make the situation worse, but rather to uh, increase security and stability? So let me put it another way for you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, we, can, we can each have a dime in our pocket, but there are two sides to it depending on which one we flip, right? So you can talk about a military presence uh, and say, well, if you're in international waters, although that goes to the very nub of our discussion, what is international waters, right? Because there are so many different demarcation lines, whether you're in the Philippines or Vietnam, whether you're in China, uh, Malaysia, et cetera, right? So... The first question is, uh, where are you? Second question is, what are you doing? Now, you know, China has every right, by the way, to assert that what some countries are doing is provocative. And other countries, including Australia, has every right to assert its right to be in what it claims to be international territorial waters. So, you know, far be it from me to push uh, a position that affords China the ability to maneuver in this space. I think what we're finding is that we have a group of countries, and I, I made this sort of comment in my opening remark, that we have a group of companies that are adhering to a certain type of law and trying to be held to that. And then we have uh, China in particular, looking to assert itself according to its own rule of law and not necessarily recognizing the international laws that we're operating under. And by the way, that's not to be critical of China for doing that. Every country is entitled to push its own national interest in a way that they believe is representative of their needs, their foreign policy and their national security. My concern is that just as China is allowed to, uh, to be quite overt in pushing its national security uh, and foreign policy, then we should be recognised to be allowed to do our own. And I think that that's the fundamental issue at hand, that we have essentially two different teams playing the one game according to two different sets of rules. And when that happens, you, of course, uh, are bound to have uh, instances of conflict uh, and, of course, uh, areas of disputation because you're not playing by the same rules. And, and, and if we look at, and in your very opening remarks today, you talked about Belt and Road. Uh, the Belt and Road is probably something that many countries and many Western OECD countries in particular could learn from. It is a very forward-facing foreign policy steeped in national security. We can have no qualms about China pushing a foreign policy agenda in its own interests, just as the Philippines, the United States, Australia should be pushing their own foreign policy and their national interests accordingly. If China has been doing it better because they've been prepared to use far greater amounts of foreign aid to get the outcomes that they want, then I would argue that then the other nation states around the world need to have a look at what they're doing and how they're doing it and respond accordingly. And I think, in fact, you've seen Australia do that very thing in the Pacific Islands. Yes, and whilst we're not talking about the Pacific Islands right now, as a direct result of China using their Belt and Road Initiative to move forward into the Asia-Pacific region within the uh, Pacific Islands, we've now seen Australia and New Zealand take quite a, a, a forward-facing policy direction themselves to say, well, hang on, that's our backyard. How can we allow China to come in and provide the level of foreign aid to these countries, which we should have probably been doing all along? And so in some respects, if it hadn't been for Belt and Road, 
some of these countries in the Pacific Islands would have been left somewhat uh, without regard, without interest, without fanfare. And it's only because of China's Belt and Road Initiative that they've been able to garner the interest of countries like Australia. And, and I think that that speaks volumes for probably where we've taken our eye off the ball in terms of foreign policy, and that's over successive governments of all political persuasions here in Australia. That's not a criticism of just one. And so if we use that from an international context, the thing that I think I'm most buoyed about is I think we're seeing far more, far greater levels of cooperation by countries in and around the South China Sea that have a direct interest in this. And, and again, we talk about claimant and non-claimant states, but let's not forget that there are trillions of dollars of trade that flow through the very straits that we're talking about. And so whether you're a claimant or a non-claimant state, you have a direct role and a direct relationship in seeing this uh, not, uh, not gather any military steam, but see it try and be resolved in a very peaceful context. Great, no, thank you, Philip, for that. Yeah, uh, one comment I would make based upon your, talk, your mention of the rules of the game, uh, which is in my comfort zone, it's in Jay's comfort zone talking about international law, is that, uh, um, you know, I, a few years ago, I was asked to speak at a conference that was talk, looking at the South China Sea and the Arctic in the same conference. And I'm like, those are two, those are apples and oranges. How can we talk about the two in one? And the more I thought about it, it was a perfect uh, bookends of one situation was a home game for the U.S. and a away game for China. The other was a home game for China and a away game for the U.S., but the genius of the system is that there is one international set of rules. Um, and so uh, as a result, you know, one of the things for years, China said that countries operating around China and the EEZ in China's EEZ, for example, were violating international law. Uh, but now we see China operating in the EEZs of the United States, of Australia, of Indonesia, of the Philippines, of Japan, of India, the list goes on. And so it's important to emphasize that, uh, that China's seeking a, a double standard in some of those situations uh, to show that, in fact, this is a political issue, not a legal issue, uh, and that we're trying to uphold international rules-based order. Yeah, but, but, but on that, Jonathan, far, yeah. far be it from me to refer back to my old political background. Uh, let's, let's not use uh, hypocrisy or opportunism to uh, align any political government or interest. There's this great saying... Uh, in Australia, always back the horse called self-interest because it's the only one trying. And so uh, if you don't have a claimant or a non-claimant state looking to assert itself with a specific view, then I, I would suggest to you, you have a state that is not interested in pushing forward its own agenda for its own people. Oh, sure. No, they each country asserts their national interest. I agree with you that, that they have to do it in a lawful manner. Uh, so... Uh, let me shift to an, another question. This is focused, I mentioned in, in my same setting remarks about uh, ASEAN and the ASEAN way. Um, since ASEAN was established, that was the model of following and making decisions by consensus. But in the current situation, Jay, as, as you know, not every ASEAN member has the same level of interest in the South China Sea situation. Uh, you've got Vietnam, you've got Philippines, you've got Malaysia, Brunei, and Indonesia, who are the ones that have direct stakes in the situation. Uh, and yet there is this kind of ASEAN way, and in, in is that an impediment, or is, is there some way for those that have a direct stake in the situation to not necessarily unite as a force, but work together in a more concerted fashion to draw strength in power, uh, draw power and strength, excuse me, through numbers? Uh, in protecting their claims in the South China Sea against China's assertiveness? Yes, uh, this one I think is an issue that really um, is under discussion still. No? It's really being challenged now, I think, because the years have shown that ASEAN really uh, has not been able to handle, to really tackle uh, this particular uh, um, regional security issue. Uh, in the first place, the structure of ASEAN, its decision-making, is not attuned uh, for this kind of uh, issue. It was really originally designed to deal with economic uh, and, and cultural uh, integration uh, primarily. And security issues were, in a way, um, out of that uh, equation uh, because the ASEAN members themselves, at the time that they were negotiating the ASEAN Treaty, had their own 
uh, problems with each other. And now, so now we're seeing after years that that, uh, that gap um, is really showing when it comes to the South China Sea. Uh, I, for one, am in favor of taking the substance, at least, of the South China Sea issues really out of the ASEAN agenda, meaning ASEAN as a whole. And I've really been uh, favoring in the past couple of years um, that the so-called uh, maritime bloc or the claimants bloc really should tackle this uh, separately now from the uh, entire organization because uh, it's become uh, quite unwieldy. The decades of negotiations for the code of conduct is your prime uh, example. Uh, and, and yet the uh, challenges, the issues, the, the uh, frictions arise uh, and take place much faster than their even their meeting schedules. So it's probably better, really, I've uh, been saying it in several fora, that it would be better for the claimants only to begin to tackle this uh, by themselves without the uh, quote-unquote uninterested or uninvolved uh, members of ASEAN. And as ASEAN, as ASEAN grows uh, uh, in the next couple of years, it will become even uh, possible, uh, maybe impossible to really deal with it uh, properly. In the meantime, uh, the um, China is... Uh, continuing to create a fight accompli you know, and really extending uh, and coercing uh, um, its uh, neighbors, imposing its, itself on the other claimants. Um, there are precedents for issues to be tackled by ASEAN members uh, separately from the ASEAN as a whole. So you have, for example, the cooperation in the Straits of Malacca and the trilateral uh, cooperative agreement you know, uh, between uh, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Indonesia. So this shows that certain issues can be tackled by them uh, separately from the organization, as long as they are uh, able to uh, agree that the, uh, the problem really needs to be addressed uh, by them already and should not uh, be allowed to fester anymore. They have, there has to be some kind of uh, breaking point, so to speak, for them to now tackle it uh, um, as a subset of, of ASEAN. And I don't think that will undermine uh, ASEAN. In fact, it might take out uh, one of the sources of, of uh, criticism uh, about ASEAN. No? Once they accept that really this, kind, this particular issue uh, should not be dealt with by ASEAN as a whole, but really by the countries directly uh, involved. Yeah, no, I, I, how is it, and, and the quintessential, the strategic question, uh, kind of as we were talking with Philip earlier, is how is it that those claimant states can work together without uh, the narrative being that they are betraying their uh, allegiances to the ASEAN system? Um, and, and you talk about, there, is there going to be a catalyst event? And, you know, a lot of what we see in the news in the past several years, uh, as, as, I, as an observer, I see the same things happening in the EEZs of Malaysia, the Philippines, Vietnam, with Chinese fishing vessels and China's maritime militia, with China's uh, maritime survey operations in each of those EEZs. You just see this constant pattern of the yes. same thing happening in different EEZs. And will that be a catalyst? Uh, unclear. I think, yeah, yes, actually, I think that that could be the catalyst really to get the, the countries involved to come up at least with common positions or to align and coordinate the responses to these uh, incidents because it's the same um, uh, tactic being employed against all of them. And so there is room for them to exchange notes and come up with a uh, some kind of unified or at least con consistent response uh, to these uh, activities. So maybe that will be the, the key, that will be what will get them eventually to agree on some kind of united uh, front uh, with respect to China on these activities. And then as time passes, they, that could be the basis for building up a broader uh, uh, range of, of uh, positions on, on their part. Yeah, and in the, uh, the battle of the demarches that happened over the past two years, we saw some common elements in some of the unilateral demarches that those claimant states issued. You start seeing some common elements within each that could potentially ultimately re result in some sort of coalescence of a, of a unified position. So thanks. Um, I wanna move now to talking about uh, what I call collective trade security. Uh, so I'll go to you, Philip, on this one. Uh, China has been the largest trading partner with so many nations, uh, has become the largest trading partner with so many nations around the world and in East Asia. Uh, this status is true for the South China Sea claimants like Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam, as well as non-claimant states like Australia, India, Japan, New Zealand, South Korea, and the United States. 
But with this status uh, comes potential leverage that Beijing can exert against any claimant or non-claimant nation that behaves in a way that China doesn't like. Cases include China's export restrictions in 2010 against Japan after the Senkaku boat collision, China's trade restrictions in 2012 on importing bananas from the Philippines uh, in the Scarborough Skull standoff, uh, and China's trade restrictions in 2016 against North South Korea uh, on tourism, cosmetics, automobiles, TV streaming, and K-pop after the THAAD missile system deployment. These cases uh, deter assertive behavior by not just those countries, but others. Uh, as the old Chinese idiom goes, uh, killing the chicken to scare the monkey. Uh, in the military context, some nations are members of defense alliances, which declare that an attack against one is an attack against all. Um, not necessarily a formal alliance, but what, if anything, can a non-claimant and, and claimant states do as a matter of agreement or policy to provide some sort of collective strength to deter economic coercion by China uh, in the future when individual states seek to assert their national interests in a way that China might dislike? Yeah, well, we're seeing that right now, Jonathan. We're, we're actually living uh, the very issues that you've described here in Australia in 2021. In 2020, uh, we had our wine sector hit with significant uh, penalties and increased tariffs uh, into China. In 2021, it's been our coal exports with uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars of coal exports being held uh, from port uh, outside in the Chinese territorial waters as China looks to assert itself from an economic position uh, in response to the foreign policy and the national security positions that Australia has taken. Now, ju just to, again, I, I'm certainly no apologist for China, nor am I uh, somebody that would acquiesce. Uh, the fact of the matter is that China is within its right to pursue whatever policy they believe are in their national interests. And uh, that includes indeed uh, undertaking a regime of economic, for what we would probably term economic sanctions uh, to make their point. Let, let me illustrate it in a different way. Uh, if we were stuck in a room with a 300 pound gorilla and it was just the two of us, I'm not sure that any of us would go up to the 300 pound gorilla and tickle it or smack it in the face and not expect a consequence. So I think, I think we need to be uh, very thoughtful in our response. But given the situation that Australia has found itself in, that collective response is one that we can demonstrate by the position that the United States has taken in support of the impact that Australia has felt, along with uh, enunciations by uh, Justin Trudeau in Canada obviously Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom, uh, and of course, uh, until recently, uh, Macron in France. So we have seen a new world order. And to coin a, you, you talked about the, uh, the, the killer chicken to uh, keep the monkeys at bay. You know, there, there's another Chinese uh, phrase that I think is perfectly uh, for this situation. And it's simply the new normal. We have a very assertive, a very aggressive, a very, very forward-facing China. And we're all struggling in how to deal with that and the consequences of China asserting themselves in a way that we're not used to. And, and so uh, I think that we need to continue to uh, work along uh, the lines that our democracies enshrine upon us, to be open, uh, to be accessible, uh, to be fair, and to also be consistent. And if we can maintain those positions, whether it be for claimant or non-claimant states and their, uh, their disputes within the South China Sea, or whether it be for uh, territorial and trading uh, disputation, then I think that there is something that we can at least point to as a consistency uh, in dealing with uh, China's new uh, policy positions. Now, when it comes to ASEAN, uh, and I just want to touch on this uh, and something that Jay said, uh, Jay, 100% spot on. ASEAN was not designed to deal with these issues. And so uh, I would have thought that the best thing that we can hope for is for ASEAN to not take a position on these issues and allow the claimant states to be able to take a position collectively 
without without a position uh, enabling obviously those countries that feel pressure with pressure within ASEAN by China to have to enter the fray. I think that my experience in Southeast Asia would dictate that that is a very likely outcome, that if they can find a way forward to allow claimant states to move forward with their own concerns uh, in their own fora, without them having to be bound by it, then that will allow them to not put forward a position in a, in a pro-China position that would affect their ASEAN neighbouring states from pushing their own agenda as well. Great. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, Jay, I would kind of ask the same question to you, but from a, a claimant state perspective. Um, and we can use, for example, the, well, like I said, the, the banana restrictions that yes. uh, China imposed on Manila at that time. You know, in yes. that type of situation, um, you know, trying to put that kind of pressure. And as, as Philip said, other countries Im impose economic sanctions at times, which they believe is in furtherance of their national policies. The U.S. imposes economic sanctions against countries for human rights violations, for example, or other reasons. Um, and in fact, for a number of times, China has condemned U.S. use of economic sanctions as unilateral as being a violation of international law, when at the same time, China was actually imposing economic sanctions on others or punishments. Um, but so with the banana situation for the Philippines, for example, um, you know, is there value in some sort of a political arrangement with other countries that, hey, if they're no longer going to buy our bananas, another country or group of countries are going to step in and buy more bananas, for example. Is that, is that a viable kind of way to, to bolster that claimant, that smaller claimant state? Yes, I think so, because actually that's what the Philippines did in that situation. Um, they actually did find uh, alternative uh, markets for those bananas. Um, and I think that that indicates really the solution to this uh, dominance of uh, China when it comes to economic uh, partnerships and trade. The solution really is, number one, for the smaller countries to band together and diversify their trade relations within uh, themselves. No? Uh, give each other basically the options and the ability to uh, absorb any uh, threats and maybe even shake it off. No? And I think uh, um, in addition, then they could also diversify beyond the region into their traditional partners to try to perhaps uh, reinv reinvigorate uh, those trade relations. Uh, those would be the best way to try to move away from this uh, um, hold that China uh, has over their uh, economies. Now, some countries, of course, will find it a little bit more difficult than others, but especially for the claimant states, I think they all have still uh, some room to maneuver in order to avoid that, uh, that kind of uh, um, situation where they're really held by the necks uh, uh, in their, their economies. We can only hope that uh, in the next few years, uh, the urgency of, of diversifying their, their trade uh, becomes even more uh, urgent no? as uh, China becomes more uh, forward leaning. Can, can I just finish yeah, off by just adding on to that? Jonathan, the, the, I'm not sure about the United States, but in Australia during the Vietnam War, there was a catch cry, love the soldier, hate the war. And I, I think that this is a missing element at the moment in a lot of the international discourse by political leaders. We need to move away from uh, grouping the activities of the CCP and the uh, administration, the Chinese administration under President Xi Jinping, with, of course, the reaction to uh, Chinese people and to China collectively. Because whilst we're here talking about uh, nation states and, and, and policies that impact upon those decision making. Uh, it would be remiss of me not to labour this point because I think that what we saw under President Trump in particular was a demonisation of China as a whole, including Chinese people. Uh, and I think that we need to move away from that because irrespective of whether there's a demonisation of Australian people in relation to our response in China, we can't be held responsible for that. All we can do is be held responsible for our own activities. And I think that the, the one uh, missing piece from our discussion uh, today has been the issue of soft diplomacy. And, and I think that at the same time, 
uh, if you uh, speak softly but carry a stick, then you can use soft diplomacy. Uh, it's not an either or proposition at the same time as calling China to account for some of its foreign policies that are impacting upon our own uh, positions in our own countries. Yeah. No, I agree with you. The, the, the demonization is a bad thing. Uh, a wholesale kind of uh, everything oversimplified in that way is a bad thing. Um, I think um, one of the other considerations to also, and that is never excusable, um, one of the other dynamics and challenges that uh, open democracies face, of course, is when the information systems are exploited. Uh, the flow of information is exploited um, in a number of ways. A, a number of times when I was engaging with the Chinese government and they would say, you have to understand our people want this. Uh, we're, have, we have, we're merely responding to our people. But if, if the, the, the people are not receiving a full information flow there, then that really is not necessarily a plausible argument to bolster their policy decision. Uh, but more importantly, and what we're seeing now is this uh, exploitation of the systems and ways for Western democracies in a lawful way to counter uh, that exploitation. Perfect example, uh, which I think is an effective way, a lawful way, a constitutional way, uh, both Australia and the US have done uh, with the US having its foreign, alien, uh, foreign Agent Registration Act where it started requiring these Chinese state-owned news media to register with the Department of Justice um, and that they are in fact agents of the government. And I know that Australia has a similar uh, law and regulations in place and a number of countries don't have those, um, but I think they are a valuable mechanism because it maintains fidelity to the democratic open societies that we pride ourselves on, but at the same time provides additional information to the consumer of information saying, um, oh, by the way, make sure you're aware that this is not just any other reporting agency. This is actually a government agent that's doing this activity. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm yet to uh, see uh, a foreign national undertaking subversive courses of action in another nation state, put their hand up and say, here I am, I'm over here. Uh, but at the, at the same time, you know, it would be churlish of us not to acknowledge that uh, each nation state will have people working on their behalf, uh, on behalf of their own national interests. And we, we can't be surprised when we find people in our own backyard doing the same for any country, whether it's China or France, the United Kingdom, the United States, et cetera. What we need to be able to do is have, as you said, policies in place that deal with it as best we can. I think we're getting to a position, as you said, where Australia and, and, and the United States are finding the balance there, uh, but we can continue to learn, continue to get better and continue to work with our partners. And just as sort of Jay was talking about the banana situation in the Philippines and finding new markets, of course, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that, you know, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, at the time of the impact of the uh, reduction in, in, in wine sales into China, uh, openly talked about every household in the United Kingdom going out and buying a bottle of Australian wine. Uh, so, you know, besides the fact that obviously it will make everybody a lot happier that particular night, the, the gesture of goodwill, that camaraderie, that, that support for each other is something that we will need to see more of. And, and they often say that your strength is your greatest weakness. And, and, and I, so I would put it to, to China. Their strength at the moment is that they are, from an economic perspective, uh, from a human capital perspective, from a societal perspective, they are an enormous part of the global order. The weakness for them is that they overplay their hand and they then push people into a position where that coalition continues to grow stronger and stronger until they wake up one day and that they will find themselves uh, on the outside of that order and find themselves having to then work out new strategies to re-enter. And I hope that we never get to that position because I think that that becomes a dangerous position for us to get to. Uh, I don't think that we're uh, close to that yet, but certainly uh, we are moving in that direction, unfortunately. Great, thank you. So I have one last question for you, uh, and I saved my most provocative question for last, uh, and it involves uh, the island building in the South China Sea. Over the past decade, as I said in my opening remarks, China is engaged in an unprecedented level. Uh, other countries have done reclamation in the past, but not at this level, uh, of building artificial islands and enhancing existing islands that it occupies in the South China Sea. 
Despite public outcry and diplomatic protests by claimants and non-claimant states alike, China has shown no indication of abandoning these political and operational gains uh, from these activities, uh, even if it's impossible as a matter for international law for China to achieve a legal uh, status of those features. Uh, the question is, should, should other claimant states, including Malaysia, Philippines, and Vietnam, should they fight fire with fire, so to speak, uh, and engage in their own share of island building and enhancing to seek comparable gains on the South China fe features that they occupy? And if so, uh, then should they seek the support of other external powers, such as the United States, such as Australia, to help undertake these activities? Uh, China obviously would argue publicly that such activities by these other claimants were destabilizing when China's actions actually, in fact, were destabilizing. Um, and a counter argument could be made that those claimant states would now just be uh, restabilizing a situation that China was the one that you unilaterally destabilized. What say you, gentlemen? Jay? Yes, I think uh, my first reaction, of course, is that uh, engaging in an island building race, <laughs> not an arms race, uh, would not be productive because one of our primary interests in the South China Sea, of course, is the environmental aspect. The fact that it is the uh, home of uh, so much uh, resources, fishery resources that we all depend on. And so more island building will continue to undermine the sustainability of these resources. And that will eventually create more possibility for conflict well, because we will be fighting over uh, more, more often over these resources. So I think on, on the long term, that would be counterproductive actually. Uh, second, um, since we cannot uh, match a China's ability to build islands, I think the response should be asymmetric in a way. We cannot, uh, we cannot uh, match them with our own islands, but there are options to neutralize the, uh, the uh, potential of those islands no? in any situation, whether it's uh, through the use, their use in support of gray zone operations or uh, in case of an armed conflict uh, of whatever scale. Uh, there, we should be exploring those options, uh, basically, to try to minimize now the impact of these, uh, these um, island bases that they built and also try to uh, prevent, hopefully, um, more islands from being uh, made, uh, whether by them or by us. I think the key here really is to just preserve the status quo at this point, uh, allow the countries at best to be able to, to do whatever is necessary to be able to maintain access uh, to their islands because that uh, again also is key to maintaining the status quo uh, in that uh, region. So I myself, I was there uh, three weeks ago uh, and I saw how the Philippines is uh, undertaking moderate improvements on uh, the largest island that it occupies and the kinds of uh, construction that is, that is going on there is simply no, uh, cannot be compared to the kind of activities that uh, China's uh, undertaken on their uh, so-called uh, islands. But it is necessary, I think, to do that because uh, that's the only way by which we will be able to uh, maintain our uh, access to that uh, position and keep the status quo. Philip, what say you? Well, let me put it another way, Jonathan. Uh, uh, the Philippines, I think, has around, what, 110 million people, Jay? Mm -hmm. Vietnam, just a tick under 100 million. Uh, Japan, 125 or thereabouts million. Uh, China, 1.5 billion. So I think if, I think if we're going to move into a an island building contest, uh, I think we're all going to struggle. Uh, I think Jay uh, is 100% uh, correct again. In fact, uh, we could have just had the discussion between you and Jay. I, I think Jay... Uh, has said it very eloquently. I think strategically you have to look at what you're wanting to try and achieve, uh, where you're trying to achieve it, what you're, what message you're trying to send. And I think, if, again, if we, if we come back to first principles, if there is a territorial dispute, I think the first and best thing that you can do is take your opponent into uh, a fora that they're not willing participants to go. Take them into an international court of dispute. Take them uh, to, uh, to challenge uh, the position that they have taken. If they don't want to acknowledge the role that the international uh, justice system 
can play in this disputation, then for mine, that would be the perfect place to start in your response. I'm not sure that, that there's much to be won in a confrontational way uh, at that point other than uh, chest beating, uh, table thumping uh, for a perception uh, and to have some kind of uh, pictorial response. So I think that I think sort of karma heads need to prevail uh, and have a look at what what is going to be able to achieve the outcome that you're wanting to do so. Uh, and once you can work through the, the outcome that you're wanting, uh, then work in much the same way. And I'll finish right on this note. It's a bit like having a reverse uh, uh, equation where Z equals X plus Y. Once you know what Z is, then you can go around building X plus Y. You, you, don't, you don't start with X plus Y to then try and arrive at Z in this type of situation. Great. Well, thank you both for answering that question. And thank you both for uh, participating in the roundtable discussion today. Uh, as we said at the beginning, it was be impossible for us to cover everything in one hour, uh, but we covered a lot. Uh, and as I often tell my classes when I teach about the South China Sea, there's no silver bullet uh, solution to the South China Sea situation or to the East China Sea situations. They're both very different, uh, but they, they also have some commonalities. But if there was a silver bullet situation uh, uh, solution, uh, it would have been used years ago. Uh, but there are ways to manage these situations and ways to improve them. Uh, and I thank you both gentlemen for sharing your thoughts on uh, how you think we can go about doing that. And with that, uh, that concludes the roundtable discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.